ดุติยัมปิบุทังสารนังกัจจามิดุติยัมปิบุทังสารนังกัจจามิดุติยัมปิธัมมังสารนังกัจจามิดุติยัมปิธัมมังสารนังกัจจามิดุติยัมปิธ
after it broke. Uh, but he said it was originally Ubarama. He was a nice monk. But palace just means the building uh, that she built in the monastery. And there's a whole story about how the monastery was built as well. Not actually a palace, it's just a fairly opulent building that was built by her. Are these buildings like uh, larger or can they be called palace or is just a smaller it's supposed to have been place? pretty big. Must have been pretty big. Mm -hmm. The certain bhikkhu rose from his seat. M.A. explained that this bhikkhu was himself an arahant and the teacher of 60 other bhikkhus who lived with him in the forest, traveling in meditation. With their teacher guidance, they had developed various inside knowledges. Therefore, their teacher brought them to see the Buddha in the hope that it would guide them to a super mundane attainments. The teacher asked the question, not because he, said that he has doubt, but in order to dispel the doubt of his disciple. Arrange his upper robe on one shoulder and extend his hands in reverent reverential salutation toward the blessed one, say to him, Venerable sir, I will ask the blessed one about a certain point if the blessed one would grant me an answer to my question. On your own seat, Biku, and ask what you like. So the Biku sat on his own seat and said to the Blessed One, Are these not, Venerable Sir, the five aggregates affected by clinging? That is, the material form aggregate affected by clinging, the feeling aggregate affected by clinging, the perception aggregate affected by clinging, the formations aggregate affected by clinging. And the consciousness aggre aggregate affected by clinging? Again, I think the word affected would probably better be replaced by something like subject to. I think he's making it a little bit, we've talked about this before, but I think he's making it a little bit complicated by adding the word affected there. It's not really the point as far as I can see it. The point is they're subject to clinging, meaning you cling to them. It's simple. The idea is that these are the five things that it's possible to cling to because they're one way of describing reality. So it's a it's a division allowing you to uh, analyze or contemplate the different ways in which it's possible to cling. It's possible to cling to rupa, and that's a, sort of a different experience than clinging to vedana and clinging to sanya, clinging to sankara clinging to vijnana. We cling in different ways, and it's not just craving, like lusting, right? Clinging can be uh, views, uh, perspective, opinions, beliefs. Uh, it can be uh, clinging out of fear or ignorance. I've never understood how you can cling to consciousness. Clinging to wanting to be conscious. What if I told you that uh, or what if someone believed that uh, after death there is nothing, that there's no consciousness, someone might get very upset about that because they cling to being alive, cling to experience. People are afraid of death for that reason, because they cling to being conscious. Thank you. It's also possible to cling, of course. It can be thought of as... Uh, clinging to specific types of consciousness, wanting to be conscious of this, wanting to be conscious of that. But that's already mixed with other aggregates, because if I want to be conscious of my body, there also there is also the form aggregate present. No? Yeah. It's still, part of it can be thought of as clinging to the consciousness, wanting to experience things wanting to go to a country like I want to visit this and visit that. Uh, it, of course, it's the, it's about seeing things, but the, the uh, general sense is of going there, of, of having the experiences, a specific sight or sound, but 
clinging to the idea of having an experience. That itself is uh, consciousness is there, right? Like chakku vinyana, sota vinyana, six yeah. types of consciousness. Yeah, the point is sometimes you cling to specifically the thing you're seeing, sometimes you cling to the consciousness of it. The point is that it's it, the real point that he's going to get into that or one of the most one of the important points is that uh, there's nothing outside of these things. That ultimately when you cling it's to one of these five things. Mahasi Sayada does a good uh, has a good explanation a reminder of that where where he basically explains how that is that people who believe that they're clinging to something special or something outside of the five aggregates ultimately it just comes down to clinging to one or another of the aggregates and the buddha of course explains that, reminds us of this various occasions this being an example uh, to talk about it i i was thinking the same thing like uh, one time like this moment or like it's only just one ag- aggregate right it's not two simultaneously i don't understand all the aggregates arise together yeah i i was thinking the the clinging part just no, iterating point is you can cling to any of the five it's maybe a little bit conceptual because if you're thinking of the abhidhamma it happens not it is a bit simplistic the way it's being talked about here of course even the aggregates are a bit of a simplistic description but it's good practically for example when you are drinking uh, tea you might notice that sugar is missing or sugar is less so you'd complain about that even though you taste all the tea in your tongue the taste of tea you know that sugar is missing so you can talk about uh, the uh, certain aspects of uh, the experience separately or you say sh- too much sugar something that you know you are not specifically tasting just sugar but bante isn't all clinging ultimately clinging to the mind because for example perception it all happens in the mind it it's all images no, ex- no because rupa isn't the part of the mind and you can cling to rupa you can cling to softness hardness warmth cool but you experience them as, sens- as sensation within your mind no you experience them as sensations with the mind they don't no. happen in the mind they happen they happen as a result of contact with the mind There's a school of Buddhism that that claims that the only thing that exists is mind and I I think rather than saying are they right or are they wrong the answer is it's just not a not the best way to describe reality reality is best described as being physical and mental duality they they talk about non-duality there's only one thing there's only the mind it, it, this is the wrong argument the wrong way of looking the wrong perspective it's not about what exists per se it's about um well what exists as uh, in, in terms of what is experience and experience is best described as physical event it's like there's uh, in in ancient times what well, we know originally there was the view that the world was flat uh, sorry that the world was the center of the universe and the stars and the sun all rotated around the earth because you could see the sun clearly was rotating around the earth that's what it looked like and because of how that's how it was experienced that that was a good way of describing things except eventually they started tracking the stars and realizing that the stars were not rotating around the earth they were doing very very complex patterns of of uh, rotation and so they had to have these very complex calculations in order to tell where the stars were going to be because the stars were following some very intricate very complicated very mysterious pattern until someone realized that they were looking at it wrong and the right way of looking at it was that the earth was not the center of the universe 
I'm not even sure if my analogy is going to be right, but the perfect. But the point is that um, if you look at the world in terms of just the mind, you have to do the same sort of mental gymnastics. You have to um, describe things in a way that kind of ignores or uh, adds un unreasonable complication beyond what you actually are experiencing. So all I meant to say is that um, having the belief that the earth is the center of the universe is going against um, what is clearly happening or what is clearly observed. And so that's the idea with when people say the, the mind is all that exists, they're kind of just going against what is clearly observable. And people do this because of the suspicion that there is something deeper Buddhism takes doesn't quite do that sort of thing where you try to find some unknown truth about reality. The, the truths, even the noble truths, are self-evident and actually quite simple. And the reason we don't see them is not because we're not looking, but because we're overlooking or making too much out of things. Mindfulness is about the simplifying of reality so that you see what's actually right there in front of you. Not that you come to a realization that, ah, oh, this is an illusion. The physical, for example, is an illusion. That's a fairly Hindu concept, that there's something hidden behind our ordinary experience. Ordinary experience is clearly physical and mental. There's nothing mysterious or hard to see about that. These bhikkhus are the five aggregates affected by clinging. And the consciousness aggregate affected by clinging, saying, Good, venerable sir, the bhikkhu delighted and rejoiced in the blessed one's words. Then he asked him a further question. But, venerable sir, and what are these five aggregates affected by clinging rooted? These five aggregates affected by clinging are rooted in desire of bhikkhu. Um, the note says, M.A. glosses Chanda by Tangha, craving, which is the origin of the suffering comprised by the five aggregates. Mm, Venerable Sir, is that clinging the same as these five aggregates affected by clinging? Or is the clinging something apart from the five aggregates? affected by clinging. Bhikkhu, that clinging is neither the same as these five aggregates affected by clinging, nor is the clinging something apart from the five aggregates affected by clinging. It is the desire and lust in regard to the five aggregates affected by clinging that is the clinging there. But, Venerable Sir, can there be diversity in the desire and loss regarding these five aggregates affected by clinging? So diversity here, I think, just means uh, uh, separation, differentiation. In other words, what we were just discussing, um, isn't it all just clinging to the same thing? No. You can cling, the Buddha's just basically going to say, yes, you, you can cling to things, to to individual to these things individually. That's what the dif diversity means, just probably differentiation is, is a more clear word. When is the di diversity refer referring to the intensity of the desire and lust as well? No, I don't think so. You can see by his, his answer that that's not what he's asking. He's just asking, can they be differentiated? Can they be separated? Where you're clinging to this aggregate or you're clinging to that aggregate, or is it all just clinging to the aggregates? Okay, thank you. There can be bhikkhu. The Blessed One said, <clears throat> Here, bhikkhu, someone thinks thus, 
May my material form be dust in the future. May my mati- may my feeling be dust in the future. May my perception be dust in the future. May my formations be dust in the future. May my consciousness be dust in the future. Thus, there is diversity in the desire and lust regarding these five aggregates affected by clinging. But venerable sir, in what way does the der- does the term aggregates apply to the aggregates? Biku, any kind of material form whatever, whether past, future or present, internal or external, gross, gross or subtle, inferior or superior, far or near, this is the material form aggregate. Any kind of feeling whatever, far or near, this is the feeling aggregate. Any kind of perception, whatever, far or near, this is the perception aggregate. Any kind of formations, whatever, far or near, this is the formations aggregate. Any kind of consciousness, whatever, far or near, this is the consciousness aggregate. It is in this way, Bhikkhu, that the term aggregate applies to the aggregates. The word is actually something more like heap or pile. Aggregate, of course, isn't a word we use a lot. It's not a bad word to use, but it's something just simple, more simple, I think, like a heap or a pile, conglomeration, um, like a, a category, basically. What is the cause and condition for the manifestation of the material form aggregate? What is the cause and condition for the manifestation of the feeling aggregate, etc., the perception aggregate, etc., the formations aggregate, etc., the consciousness aggregate? Dante, uh, what, what is the difference in the Pali words Hetu and Tachayo? So it's not basically the same? Uh, sometimes they are. But if you look at the different bhajaya, bhajaya are um, the ways in which something is the uh, is a condition or the way in which something affects something else or causes something to be. Hetu bhajaya is caused by being a cause but you can cause by being by you can cause in different ways but hetu pache is like kind of redundancy almost but it means you cause something to you cause something else by being its cause but you can cause something else or you know, that's not even the right way to say it you can be a part of the reason why something comes into being without being its direct cause. You can be uh, uh, something that comes after something else. You can uh, cause something to come about. The, the jhanas, for example, can cause different things to come about, but they're not exactly the uh, the direct hetu. Okay, but yes, the, the words the words are in in certain places used synonymously. In Thai, they actually say it like that. They say something is the hate but jai. It's uh, they they it's just a word. They put them both together and they say that that thing is the hate but jai of that thing. Hate is hate to and but jai is but jaya. Bin hate bin but jai. They'll even say it like that. It's the hate to. It's the but jaya. But Jaya is a little more general, or it's it's not, I think, but it's used in ways that are more general. It's it's used to, if you look at the different Bhajaya in the in the uh, Mahapatana, if you want to to understand the sort of distinction, you can read about the different Bhajaya and see that Hetu Bhajaya is one of them and what it describes. So I say we should read the Mahapatana at least that beginning part. Something at some point we should probably do. Not that it will explain much, but it'll just let you see see the, the 
Buddha's teaching in the Abhidhamma. Pachapanna means born of causes, right, Bhante? No. Uh, not not as I've been taught it. Uh, the etymology is pati upada, pati upata, upa, pati upana. So upana means arises, and pati means specifically. Pati is an interesting prefix, specifically here, meaning uh, here and now, only here, specifically, like the, in this specific place. So the Thai translated as that which arises in front of you, pati upana. It's, it's misleading because of the pacha, right? Pach, pachu, pacha is from pati and u. Pati often becomes pacha. Uh, where does the word pachaya come from? Pachaya, I think, is a gerund. But how is it formed? But yeah, I'm not sure. We should look up pachaya here. It comes from pati and e. E would be to go specifically. I think the idea is that something comes or comes uh, specifically from something else. Like this is the thing that or maybe goes, this is the thing that leads to. Again, we see here he's using Hetu and Pachya as, as, as synonyms, but they mostly are used synonymously, I would say, but technically, in technical uh, situations, they are used distinctly, like in the Abhidhamma, basically. Can you make a distinction saying that uh, Hetu is that which causes and the uh, Pache is the, the act of causing? I, th I think um, the words have had a different meaning or were used uh, or were given a different t uh, literal meaning but were used conventionally in, in as synonyms for the most part. But when you want to talk about different ways that things are uh, related or causal, you need more words. You need to use words distinctly to be able to say more things. Like if you want to say, this thing is con is a condition for something else because it's a cause, then you have to say, hey, tu pachaya. But then you say, another type of pachaya, you're saying it's a condition not because it's a cause, but it's a condition because it arises together with that thing, for example. That's kind of oh, yeah. conditional. Like this thing can't arise without that thing. So that thing is a pachaya for this thing because it arises together, sahajata pachaya. And there's even pachajata pachaya, which is interesting, potentially meaning that because something else is going to happen, this thing happens first. So the future can affect the past. It kind of, not that's going too far, I think, but the future um, necessitates the past. Uh, and, and why I bring this up and think it's interesting is because there are, there are cases where someone is aware of something that hasn't happened yet. People who, who are pre precognitioned where they're aware of something that hasn't happened. And it's not that they can see into the future, it's that that thing happening in the future has to be preceded by certain things. Uh, th those certain things preceded in and can include visions of the thing that is going to happen. So it's not about the past, future coming back to the past. It's about there being a necessary relationship. The future is not a hetu, Pachaya of the past, but it's a pacha jata pachaya, meaning the fact that that's going to happen is what, not what causes, but is, um, you could say, the reason for you having those precognitions. There's a relationship. For example, uh, it was uh, foretold uh, by Buddha Tipankara that uh, the Bodhisattva is going to become a Buddha in this certain lifetime. So, he had to uh, do all those. Maybe that, that was a cause of what... 
Right. The fact that he's going to become a Buddha means he, ha he did, is why all those things that he did, why he became yeah. his Bodhisattva. Yeah. And yeah. living the lay life. But I think it's important just to remember that's not a hetupachya, meaning it's not the future somehow already existing and causing something in the past to happen as a as a hetu. It's just as a pachya. So it's confusing. And it may just be descriptive, like a means of talking about things in different ways. But it also is curious that people have precognition that, that there arises echoes of the future in the past. Someone can see something, like the Buddha many times described things that were going to happen, said, oh, and then this will happen and that will happen. He saw what was going to happen before it happened. The four, the four great elements, Bhikkhu, are the cause and condition for the manifestation of the material form aggregate. Contact is the cause and condition for the manifestation of the feeling aggregate. Contact is the cause and the condition for the manifestation of the perception aggregate. Contact is the cause and condition for the manifestation of the formation aggregate. Mentality and materiality is the cause and condition for the manifestation of the consciousness aggregate. The 1040. In the material form aggregate, each of the four great elements is a condition for the other three and four and four derived material form. Contact is a condition for each of the three middle aggregates. As it is said, contacted one feels because contacted one perceives, contacted one wills. Emma explains that at the moment of conception, the material phenomena and the three mental aggregates that arise are the mentality, materiality, that is the condition of the rebirth consciousness. During the course of life, the physical sense faculties and the sense objects together with the three mental aggregates are the mentality, materiality, that is a condition for the sense consciousness. In that uh, comment, it says, like, uh, is the condition for other three. What, what, what is the great form? Is that like uh, perception, consciousness, and the feeling? No, the three are, are Vedana, Sanya, and Sankara. Uh, Those are the three. Vedana, Sanya, and Sankara. This uh, Vedna Sang Sangya and Sankara, what is uh, uh, the, in the five aggregate, is also same uh, Vedna and S Sangya and Sankara in Patitisamutpada, right? Or they are different? Uh, no, the Sankara is, is a different usage of the word. I mean, and there's overlap, but it's not used in the same way there. Sanya also isn't in Patitisamutpada. I mean, it is there, but it's not explicitly mentioned. Honorable Sir, how does identity view, identity view come to be? Here, Bhikkhu, an untaught ordinary person who has no regard for noble ones and is unskilled and undisciplined in their Dhamma, who has no regard for true men and is unskilled and undisciplined in their Dhamma, regards material form as self or self as possessed of material form or material form as in self, or self as in material form. He regards feeling as self, perception as self, for formations as self, consciousness as self, or self as possessed of consciousness, or consciousness as in self, or self as in consciousness. That is how identity view comes to be. This is how the aggregates are very useful. You can see they provide a very s simple yet accurate uh, description of reality and allow us to see the different ways in which people cling and how there arises clinging to self, how there arises uh, possessiveness or identity, attachment.
in chapter 11. But, Venerable Sir, how does a tentative view not come to be? Here, Bhikkhu, a well-taught noble disciple who has regard for noble ones and is skilled and disciplined in their dharma, who has regard for true men and is skilled and disciplined in their dharma, does not regard material form as self or self as possessed of material form or material form as in self or self as in material form. He does not regard feeling as self, perception as self, formations as self, consciousness as self, or self as possessed of consciousness, or consciousness as in self, or self as in consciousness. That is how identity view does not come to be. 12. What, Venerable Sir, is the gratification? What is the danger? And what is the escape in the case of material form? What is the gratification? What is the danger? And what is the escape in the case of feeling, in the case of perception, in the case of formations, in the case of consciousness? Pleasure and joy, Bhikkhu, that arise in dependence on material form. This is the gratification in the case of material form. Material form is impermanent, suffering, and subject to change. This is the danger in the case of material form. The removal of desire and lust, the abandonment of desire and lust for material form. This is the escape in the case of material form. The pleasure and joy that arise in dependence on feeling, in dependence on perception, in dependence on formation, in dependence on consciousness. This is the gratification in the case of consciousness. Consciousness is impermanent, suffering and subject to change. This is the danger in the case of consciousness. The removal of desire and lust, the abandonment of desire and lust for consciousness. This is the escape in the case of consciousness. Venerable Sir, how does one know, how does one see, so that in regards to this body with its consciousness and all external signs, There is no eye-making, mind-making, and underlying tendency to conceit. Bhikkhu, any kind of material form whatever, whether past or present, internal or external, gross or subtle, inferior or superior, far or near one, far or near one sees, all material form, as it actually is with proper wisdom thus, this is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself. Any kind of feeling whatever, any kind of perception whatever, any kind of formations whatever, any kind of consciousness whatever, one sees all consciousness as it actually is with proper wisdom thus. This is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself. It is when one knows and sees thus, that in regard to this body with its consciousness and all external signs, there is no eye-making, mind-making, or underlying tendency to conceit. Then in the mind of a certain bhikkhu, this thought arose. So it seems material form is not self, feeling is not self, perception is not self, formations are not self, consciousness consciousness is not self. What self then? Will actions done by the not self affect? Commentary. It seems that this Viku had difficulties, difficulty in understanding how karma can produce results without a self to receive them. Then the Blessed One, knowing in his mind the thought in the mind of that Viku, addressed the Vikus thus, It is possible, Vikus, that some misguided man here, obtuse and ignorant, with its uh, with his mind dominated by craving, might think that he can outstrip the teacher's dispensation. Thus, so it seems material form is not self, consciousness is not self. What self then will actions done by the not self affect? Now, because you have been trained by me through interrogation on various occasions in regards to the various things. The commentary 
1043. The readings of this sentence are highly divergent in different editions. The same sutta appears at uh, SN22 colon 82 104 and the readings there Dr. Puccha Vin, Vinita seems preferable to the reading here in PTS Paticca Vinita in BBS Patta Vinita the translation here follows the Sunita text uh, NM's translations based on the PTS Majima text reads Now, Viku, you have been trained by me in dependent conditionality in various instances. Neither version is idiomatic pali, and commentaries to both Nikayas are silent. 15. Bikus, what do you think? Is material form permanent or impermanent? Impermanent, Vernable Sir. Is what is impermanent suffering or happiness? Suffering, Venerable Sir. Is what is impermanent suffering and subject to change, fit to be regarded thus? This is mine. This I am. This is myself. No, Venerable Sir. Bhikkhus, what do you think? Is feeling, perception, formations, consciousness, Permanent or impermanent? Impermanent, Venerable Sir. Is what is impermanent suffering or happiness? Suffering, Venerable Sir. Is what is impermanent suffering and subject to change fit to be regarded thus? This is mine. This I am. This is myself. No, Venerable Sir. I, I just want to go back. It's a very small point, but it might be a little bit helpful to note. Uh, where it says he might think he can outstrip the de teacher's dispensation. I don't think that's what it's saying. Uh, I think should. The word can should be replaced with should. Mm. Uh, and the meaning here is just that he thinks he should, he sh he, 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 his mind goes in a direction that outstrips the, that goes beyond what the Buddha teaches. I mean, it, it goes outside. Um, yeah, I'm not quite sure. Ati Dawit Tabang thinks he should uh, he should go somewhere that that goes beyond the Buddha's teaching because you notice that the Buddha's response doesn't actually answer the the question, and that's important because the Buddha doesn't say there is no self, there is no soul. Uh, it, it's these ideas of what exists that are kind of antithetical and anathema or, or uh, they have no real part in the Buddha's teaching. It's not the point. We're not trying to argue philosophical existence. Does something exist? We're trying to argue or, or not argue. We're trying to discover the nature of that which is experienced because existence really is limited to experience. That is the best way of understanding this word, ex this word existence, rather than does something exist? There is experience, and that clearly does exist in the way of describing it. And so he just re reiterates, basically, or or, or maintains that there are limitations on what you can talk about, uh, uh, what you can talk about uh, accurately as existing, and that is the five aggregates. In other words, talk about something outside of the five aggregates is just meaningless. It, by its very nature, is meaningless. Therefore, because any kind of material form, whatever, whether past, future, or present, all material form should be seen as it actually is, with proper wisdom thus. This is not mine. This I am not. This is not myself. Any kind of, feel, of feeling, whatever, etc., any kind of perception, whatever, etc., 
any kind of formation, whatever, etc., any kind of consciousness, whatever, etc. All consciousness should be seen as it actually is, with proper wisdom, thus. This is not mine. This I am not. This is not myself. Seeing thus, a well-thought, well-thought noble disciple becomes disenchanted with material form, disenchanted with feeling, disenchanted with perception, disenchanted with formations, disenchanted with consciousness. Being disenchanted, he becomes dispassionate. Through dispassion, his mind is liberated. When it is liberated, there comes the knowledge. It is liberated. He understands, birth is destroyed. The holy life has been lived. What had to be done has been done. There is no more coming to any state of being. That is what the Blessed One said. The bhikkhus were satisfied. One's words. Now while this discourse was being spoken, through not clinging the minds, through not clinging, the minds of sixty bhikkhus were liberated from the taints. And the note says, the sixty bhikkhus discarded their original meditation subjects and investigated a new subject based on the Buddha's discourse. Without breaking their posture right in their seats, they attained arahanship. Sadhu, 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 sadhu. It seems like the one who was misguided also who had his mind clear after thinking about the self. Bhante, you said it's meaningless to talk about something outside the five aggregates. But isn't Nibbana outside the five aggregates? Yeah. Well, so Nibbana, it, it's just words that... When I said something, I meant something as the thing that arises. But yes, I mean, technically you're correct. I should have been more specific. But when we sometimes that's the case when we talk about things, we're talking about arisen things. But Nibbana can be experienced, so it's not uh, an imagination. Yeah, I mean, it depends what you mean by experience. But yeah, what? nibbana is nibbana is kandavimutti. So you're correct. There is technically something outside of five aggregates, but not a thing in the sense of a self or something. When in uh, nibbana there is no vedana, how can it be experienced? Well, you could say it's experienced in the sense. So when we say this, it's the same as when others say um, it, the consciousness takes Nibbana as an object. Like yeah, there's different ways of describing it. Nibbana is the cessation. You could say it's an experience of cessation. It's the same like when you say that uh, you you see something that there is no, no there. You experience something that's lack, lack, lacking, not existing or something similar. So the experience of something lacking is actually the experience of a thought or a perception of the thing that is lacking. You can't actually experience an absence of something. This question is related to what we talked earlier about materiality being separate from mentality. Um, if if, if materiality doesn't have a mind as, an co as a cause, then why is there order in the universe? Like, materiality obeys certain laws, specific laws. Doesn't this... Um, doesn't this um, suggest an intelligent cause behind the universe not at all why would it suggest that because it, materiality is ordered it obeys certain laws well there's certain patterns I wouldn't I think you're overemphasizing the word law 
a law is a, is a thing handed down by a sentient being, yes. But we observe certain patterns in physical, that's all it is. Actually, actually, even uh, physicists say that it's uh, more like the entropy is more like chaos. Like you, you say it's all in order or something, but uh, it's not all like that. Yeah, and, and the order and the the laws or whatever but, all break down anyway. A, on yeah, not way. always yeah. working. And even they the end time, up just being patterns. And even the time until it. And, and even the time it took until it came to the point where it is right now, let's say the solar system, everything took a huge time and it's not perfect at all. Always yeah, errors, I mean, if, after if anything, errors after if, mistakes. If, anything, the physical after shows mistakes. That if there was a creator, it was pretty unintelligent. Yeah, and still. And also, whatever. Uh, Reality arising always require causes. Without the causes, doesn't arise. Nobody can make things happen without the causes. So the causes are not there. It's not going to happen. Buddhism, in fact, believes in unintelligent design. Our existence is because of lack of intelligence, not intelligence. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I just don't see that order part that Remus was saying about. It's it's nonsense. Well, we observe uh, relationships and patterns, like what goes up must come down, gravity. Mm -hmm. But sometimes it fails. Go to the different part of the Earth, and on the Moon is different gravity again. It's not. It's not always that. But it's all according to certain laws. You can predict what kind of gravity you have on Earth, or yeah, but or, you're 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 overreaching when you say law, because I mean, you're just perfect. observing patterns. Yes, and perfect design. But that's the that's the word that physicists use. Uh, maybe it's misleading. I but don't know that they do use that word much. They talk about the yeah. theory. Uh, they don't usually talk about laws in, in science. I think I think religion scientists will not use that. They they know about entropy and everything. Quantum and they know that Every, everybody's yeah. uncertain because of quantum uncertainty. Not quantum uncertainty, yeah. but because of the un uh, the unexplainable uh, quant nature of quantum reality. Yeah, so the quantum physics, since of quantum physics, no one is sure of, about anything. If you talk about physicists. So but I think you talk about religious people, religion. No, uh, actually, some scientists do use the word law, but yes, it's misleading. But what I wanted to ask is... Um, so the Theravada um, theory is that um, there is an infinite chain of, of causes and effects that has no beginning whatsoever. whatsoever. Um, I, yeah, I'm kind of hesitant to say yes, but not really the sort of thing the Theravada focuses on. A beginning point cannot be observed. That is, I think, a better way to put it that thing. There is no beginning. Yeah, if you keep looking into the past, you just keep becoming the cause for those past memories. So it's a pachajata pachaya, maybe. So the, the, the three characteristics uh, is, uh, is evidence that they decide. If it is a design, it is not intelligent. Well, we are the design. We design our future existences with our lack of intelligence. Lack of wisdom is the point. If we had wisdom, 
we wouldn't design lives lives that lead, that involve suffering. We wouldn't in design lives at all. In wisdom, we would let go. Uh, that's that's what uh, Theravada monk suggested that evolution is the result of consciousness trying to find vehicles for itself blindly, not through intelligence, but through unintelligence. Like, yeah. Unintelligence. Lack of wisdom. So when they use this word intelligent design, they really mean wisdom. Or well, maybe that's not quite what they mean. But it involved, The idea is that it's by someone who knew what they were doing, who had who had good reasons for doing it, which is observably false. Nobody could have a good reason for creating a world, let alone a universe like this. So if you, if you have a... Assuming that there was nothing in the beginning, if you, have, if you get the urge to create something, that means you are lacking something, you are unsatisfied with something. If you are unsatisfied, that means you are not perfect. If you are not perfect, you are not a god. Yeah, I mean, in a way, there's nothing wrong with the universe per se. It's just uh, the clinging that's the problem. You should, I think, getting having the attitude of condemning the universe wouldn't be a good, like, like, could lead to aversion and nihilism, the desire to not exist desire to get rid of the universe or something. But with wisdom, you would let go, and as Sanka says, you wouldn't uh, want to create. You don't see any reason to cling, brave. You would be content. Uh, also, I just, I just um, remember that also, the universe is so dangerous. Like even our sun will explode, and so many stars are like, or you know, many things are just just a danger to the other. I I don't I really don't see the <clears throat> perfect design. But nobody suggested there's a perfect design. They they just said that that there's a regularity to the universe. I didn't say it's wise or um, mm -hmm. well-intended. Of course, okay, there's, always gonna be one, like one, there's always going to be one way things work. The mind is the same. I mean, things can't work in two different ways. That's just regularity. Of course, there's going to be regularity. There's always also going to be irregularity, and we see both. And also, we do there's no reason to think that there's uh, something extra that is causing that. Also, the word entropy implies the notion of order, because if everything would be chaos, the word entropy would have no meaning, because entropy means things going towards a chaotic um, state. Yeah, I think the most important point is uh, what you're talking about is exactly what the Buddha pointed out as being uh, the wrong way of looking at things. So going beyond this word he uses, adidavitabang. You think that you should go outside, of, you should run past adidav in regards to running. You should run beyond what is uh, what is real. So as soon as you start thinking about some uh, external thing like a god or so on, or a, an intelligence or something, a creation, a creator, uh, you've you've squarely and and categorically left behind what is real, what is possible. They talk about. Uh, the God of the gaps, that God is uh, God is only able to exist where our knowledge is absent. 
So in history, you can see this is the case. When we didn't know the cause of something, God was the answer. But as the gaps filled in, God disappeared more and more and had to take up residence in other gaps. Kind of like that. God can only exist outside of reality. Pante, can you say, can you explain it to me? When you before said um, um, there is nothing behind the experience like the Hindu culture uh, explain. Before when we was reading the Sutta. What part do you want to explain? Um, I didn't understand uh, why you say that because... Um, Uh, you know, like all this arising and ceasing of uh, of experience. In my mind, I think that there is like an efflux of flow in the world. So when you say there is nothing behind the experience, what do you mean? There, there should be something. Should there? Why should there be? I don't know. <laughs> I was asking you because I, I cannot understand. I have this concept of which probably is wrong in my mind. Yeah, it's just uh, a you concept. Know. I mean, you, there's no reason to think there's anything. Um, yeah, it's not even quite so much that there is anything because you're getting into ideas of, they're just concepts of, of a thing existing, of anything existing. Uh, the point is that reality is pretty clear. There's experience. Experiences arise and cease, that's all, that's it. The idea of there being something existing behind is it's just the wrong way of looking at things, the wrong sort of outlook or perspective or uh, focus, mm. the wrong way of thinking. Yeah, like it's because... It's, it's, it has no conclusion, it, it, it can lead to no solution or no uh, resolution mm. by its very nature it's impossible to get a resolution that way. this is uh, again i always go back to descartes because i really think that he was he had an, a good way of look of approaching the problem where he said all of these things you're talking about could just be uh, illusion they could be deception And there's only one set of things that are free from that potential by their very nature. And therefore, you can actually know them. And that is, he didn't say this, but that is experiences. By their yeah. very nature, you can't know that sort of thing about God or self or anything beyond experience. You run, you run beyond Uh, what is what is true, what is Dhamma? You run beyond the Dhamma. But, you know, like, um, um, I was not talking specifically about God, but I was talking about uh, uh, other experience that we may experience in the future, well, you know, like... Yeah, like... No, it's because just... Um, um, or... I think, okay, my mind is now gross and I cannot uh, experience certain things, but I may do in the future. And I understand this is tricky, you know, just even to talk about it. But uh, it is difficult because sometimes it, this has blocked me in meditation. I don't quite understand what you're getting at. Uh, what, what you might experience in the future will just be experiences. Yeah, of course. Oh, maybe she's talking about these feelings of transcendent. Because yeah, exactly. This is... of, and she says that maybe when our minds become pure, we will be able to experience a transcendent reality. So, yeah, exactly. This is what I, was, I meant to say. And uh, you, uh, when you say there is nothing behind the experience, is where I say, oh, you know, That's, yeah, an, that's another experience. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, experience transcendent experience is, is not categorically different. Still just seeing, nothing, hearing, uh, smelling, tasting, yeah. feeling, thinking. Except Nibbana. Uh, 
I don't mean to leave out the most important thing that the nibbana is what you, what you come to when you realize this that experiences are empty void of any mm. substance void of anything behind them like what i was going to say to interrupt what was interrupting you with was um like not just self or soul also rock like a rock or a, a tree the rock and the tree don't actually exist behind the experience of them or it's not see it's you not that's not the way of saying it. it's just the wrong conversation it's it's not an accurate way of describing reality when you talk about the tree exists the tree doesn't exist that even just saying it doesn't exist is already running beyond what's real yeah you're already outside of the the framework which you can actually use to describe uh reality it it's not meant to be confusing or mysterious or complicated it's meant to actually simplify seeing is just seeing hearing is just hearing when you see a rock the reality the 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 best way to say what is real is to just say there is an experience seeing. of seeing and there is yeah. the conception of a rock because outside of that we don't know we don't know maybe we're in a virtual reality simulation and the rock isn't actually quote unquote mm. there but you can go beyond that and say it doesn't really matter because you know, reality doesn't admit to rocks and trees and souls and gods they are by very definition the sorts of things that have no relationship with experiential reality so no it is it is a very simple uh, all, the only thing is that the mind sometimes mm, wanted to believe something else or yeah for sure i mean that, that's a very important very important fact that the mind does want those things and that's a very big part of why we practice yeah thank you bande bande uh, i i have a question on this number 5 is isn't chanda and the tanha two different thing i mean it, it, as if in this They're just words number, so is it the same tanha and chanda i thought chanda just is words. like a, a wholesome and tanha is unwholesome right no no chanda is a word that is sometimes used to describe uh, sometimes used in ways that can be thought of as that can be yeah sometimes used to describe wholesome states just a word okay so most of the it's used to describe unwholesomeness but but by the na- the nature of the word is that it allows for that because it doesn't literally mean craving or desire it's something more like interest because right. interest you can be interested in something in a wholesome way because it's free from desire right uh, but it's a way of describing Uh, interest or in Thai they say pajai which means contentment when you're content with something like we can say you're happy with it we would say in english maybe i'm happy to be doing this or something like that i'm happy to be meditating when often that is desire but it doesn't literally mean desire chanda doesn't mean happy but it's the same way in english we say it we don't say i'm content to do this we say i'm happy to do this and Polly it was more like I'm content to do this but your reason for being content for doing it could be because you like it it also be because you're wise and you know that it's good for you it doesn't quite mean contentment santuti is the word for contentment the singhali session but they use the term chandarag instead of just chand well here he does sometimes You, you can see in the pali the word is sometimes chandaraga but there is a place where he just uses chanda i think the, the, that's why the buddha adds the word raga because you have to clarify that chanda is not always raga where he says they're rooted in, he says they're rooted in desire the word isn't desire the word is chanda you may think just a second maybe confirm yeah chanda mulaka 
Imekobiku Panchupadana Kanda Chandamulaka. But after he says Chandamulaka, then he starts using Chandaraga. So, uh, he, he says that Chanda comes from uh, Skanda, which means in regards to jumping. So it's a very old word from Vedic, from Vedic uh, related to jumping. So where the mind jumps at the idea, is inclined or is has the impulse towards which which it, it evolved to be just a word that was used fairly neutrally to describe like when we when we say in meditation when you stand when you're going to stand up you say wanting to stand but it's not that you crave standing or there's desire for it you just want to you can want to meditate without having desire for meditation i misformulated my question when I said that there's an intelligent cause behind reality, it meant the fact that, let's say, the moon doesn't hit the earth, so the, it enables... I didn't say that it's an ultimate intelligence, so, or that it's for the best, for the or, or highest, highest good, or something like that. I mean, when we say... It's, it's not an important question, anyhow. So, it's just about the regularity of the universe. Well, there are forces beyond what we normally understand, you could say. Like, maybe there is involvement with the, by the daylights and that sort of thing. Not to conceptually think about the world as being more complicated and there being, yeah. like, because, yeah, you do see order. I mean, look in the human world skyscrapers are pretty orderly uh traffic flow is you know reasonably orderly it's not complete chaos except in sri lanka and india i'm just kidding especially if you take a tuk driver <laughs> those tuk tuk drivers but if you want to get to a place very fast they will do a great job <laughs> Not very safe uh, all the time, but can save a lot of time. So with the uh, the Deva world is probably, uh, the Deva's involvement is probably somewhat similar. Like some of the regularity you see is Deva's. There's men mention in the suttas about Devas that create. Or maybe it's not mm -hmm. about creating our universe. It's about creating their own. The one just below the highest uh, angel realm. Uh, but it's still suffering non self and permanent. But, well, actually, I think uh, according to uh, Akana Sutta, uh, once the uh, world system gets destroyed, the Brahmas in the highest Brahma realms, they uh, start to wish for the world system to appear again because they miss uh, seeing places where they can uh, hear the Dhamma, miss seeing the beauty of the world, something like that. So they keep hoping for that uh, for a long time. That is also uh, given as one of the causes for things to start up again. It is not the only cause, but they keep checking for it for a long time. I was wondering in section 8 um, where it talks about um, feeling near and far, perception near and far, informations near and far, consciousness near and far, what the near and far means, or far, far and near, far or near. Sorry, was that a question? I was preoccupied. What far, like, I don't understand how um, feeling can be far. I, I think it meant past and present, right? For, for no, 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 no. The point is you, the realization you come to is universal. So you don't still think, well, these Vedana are, are non-self, but 
maybe some other way to know that I would have somewhere else. Uh, or, or like that's the, the maybe the way to know that they're having in Japan is uh, is self or so on. That's all it means. Yeah, like uh, people believing that uh, once we go to heaven, it's all eternal. Yeah, that's the point. Maybe in heaven there will be way to know that is eternal and stable and controllable. So the point is that the wisdom that you gain is uh, is universe, is general. It's not specific. And that's the distinction between the vipassana jnanas, which can involve specific instances of seeing impermanent suffering and non-self, and the realization of the Four Noble Truths, which is the acceptance of the reality that that's just the nature of things. It's so it, the clarity is is of the the very uh, nature of experience in general. It's not being able to satisfy. It's not possible that there should be a way to know somewhere that someone is experiencing that is stable, satisfying, or controllable. But Bante, some people seem completely content and satisfied with worldly experience. Well, they have good, good. Uh, they've done good deeds in the past. Just cause and effect. Oh, so some I'm people's sorry. brains. Some people's brains are more able to uh, feel happiness than others. So they're much more content than others. Much more quick to rebound from uh, adversity. But like I've seen such people, I've seen such people devastated. The point is that their brains allow them to quickly adapt, quickly uh, adjust, quickly return to a state of happiness. Animals, you can see this simple functionality in animals when they are uh, bitterly uh, fighting with each other and in, in terrible pain and then immediately then recover very quickly. Not, not because of their merit, but because of the, you can see that the mind is able to do that. So it's with humans or with animals as well, there's there's differences in ability to adapt to uh, recover, just in terms of the how the brain works as well. Also, unsatisfactoriness means that. No Vedana are permanently satisfactory, so they can be temporary satisfactory. No, no, they are not satisfying. Uh, some you know people who are who are happy and live happily tend to be low on the desire scale. They tend to not be overly clingy. They tend to have contentment. It's just the result of good things they've done in the past. Someone is, say, a rich person is greedy and wants more and more. They're never going to be really happy. They're probably miserable most of the time, even though they're rich. Analogy, there's an analogy. It's given, uh, uh, it's like the crab who is uh, uh, like rejoicing in, the, in a cooking pot because he just got put into the water after like, uh, maybe being packed inside a box. He got put into the water. Now he uh, he's playing in the water. He doesn't know that he's uh, just about to be cooked. He's happy in the water <laughs> until uh, the stove is lit on fire or the stove is turned on. So PT is Vedana. It is uh, Sankara, I think. Oh, it's still the five aggregates. Are you looking for something that's outside the five aggregates? I think you misunderstand what they mean. Yeah, they're all they're all encompassing. And another question about the five aggregates. Maybe this is too complicated, but when we say everything is conditioned. Like when we have 
space what what is space conditioned by because and i'm asking this because some buddhist schools uh, accept uh, space or akasha as being an unconditioned thing you know this no, is no space is a derived quality of matter it's, oh. it's a physical thing space only exists because matter matter creates it as a derived quality because of the way matter works there arises the let's say the experience or you might even say the illusion of space but it's not quite an illusion it's just a derived quality it's not the actual experience but it's a part of the the nature of the way experience works that there be space and it's only just something very simple and is is this uh true also for time no time is not limited to the physical of course this is a non related question but will there be tomorrow a meeting for the mentorship oh yeah we should probably start bringing it up on saturdays so sunday we have this mentorship meeting We'll try to be there as well. Or we will uh, try to be a support group for people who are doing things in their community, starting meditation groups, uh, showing people how to practice, or even just uh, bring people to the at-home course, or let people know about our center here. So that's tomorrow, same time as today, but tomorrow, same time as this meeting. Okay, I guess that's all for this week then. Have a good week, everyone. Thank you, Bhante. Thank you, Bhante. Thank you, Bhante.